All right. I think we have everybody here. And I believe we have our online folks. So welcome to everybody here in our audience. We do have some in, very brave in-person people. We're so happy to have you out here to our Beecher Park location. And hello to our online group, uh, Jim in the back there. We have everybody in? We're good to go? Okay, wonderful. Well, my name is Gabby Hughes, and I'm one of the educators here at Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania. And uh, today, we are going to be learning about milkweeds and monarchs. And we will get to that in just a moment. <laughs> but just some housekeeping. For those of you that are here in person, your most important bit of housekeeping is where the bathrooms are. So <laughs> they're right outside this door or up the ramp. Those of you at home, I can't help you there. <laughs> you have to figure that one out for yourself, I'm sure you know. Um, second bit of housekeeping, those folks that are online, um, we do have your microphone and your camera um, hidden and you're muted. That does not mean you don't get to ask questions. We love questions and the same for the folks here in our live audience. Um, those of you online, your chat function works really well. So you'll notice there's a little um, chat button, has a little window down there at the bottom. Anytime you have a question or if you can't hear me, I know I'm talking through a mask, so it can be kind of a challenge to hear. Um, and you can't hear me or if you have a question about what's up on screen or the presentation, just type it into the chat room. Um, we have Jim Bonner, who's our executive director back there. He'll be monitoring the chat. If it's something super relevant to what I'm saying right then and there, he may interrupt, but um, we also will have breaks during the presentation to, to ask questions, okay? Does that sound good for everybody? Wonderful. Well, first of all, I would like to um, welcome in person and online, you can just sort of type it into the chat if you would like if you're online. How many of you are part of our Certified Backyard Habitat Academy? We're wonderful, or your Certified Backyard Habitat Program, I should say. Wonderful, we're so happy. And those of you online, I know we have some CBH people um, online, Certified Backyard Habitat. We'll be talking about that a little later in the presentation. Um, I also would like to give a very special hello to my local neighborhood pollinator garden group, the Wilkins Park Pollinator Garden Group. We have a few folks online from that we were really really happy that they could join us they're doing great things there in the neighborhood so today i'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen and our presentation here bear with us this is our first both live in person and simulcast live zoom presentation so we're going to hopefully there we go <laughs> all right so, as I mentioned, we're Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania. I know we do have a few folks possibly online from outside of the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Um, we are located just outside of Pittsburgh. If you have not been here before, um, our website, aswp.org, I'm going to be talking about things that are available on our website today. I am also going to be directing you to resources on our web website. And I am going to be sending all of you via email a number of resources, including our website links today. But um, we are located here in Western Pennsylvania. And trying to advance our slide here. There we go. Um, we are right now at our um, Beachwood Farms Nature Reserve location here in Fox Chapel. If you are in the Pittsburgh area, please come out and visit us. We have um, miles of trails, about three and a half to four miles of trails, and um, it's a wonderful place, especially now during COVID-19, where you're a little bit restricted in what you can do. Come on out and visit us um, and walk the trails. It's a beautiful time of year to do that. If you're up in the Butler area or with just like a drive, our Suck Up Nature Park up in Butler has a lovely trail system as well. And my personal favorite is our Todd Nature Reserve in Sarger, PA, which um, Maybe doesn't have the infrastructure yet, uh, so uh, I'm talking bathrooms. <laughs> but it has one of the most beautiful trail systems of all of our reserves. So I, I really do invite you all to go out there um, and and see it. Let me try and get rid of this little guy here. 
Just the two. 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 Just the Trying to get rid of this little picture for you. So you can you see that negative sign on the top left? Go left, 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 go there. Okay, that one just takes it. Well, then you can pull it down. You can pull it down now. So you grab the top part of it and you can pull it down. Not doing it. That's pretty good. <laughs> Sorry, folks, it wasn't like this yesterday when we tested this out. All right. Well, we are going to soldier together. Yeah, and you can also, when you're trying, when you're talking, as much as you can face the camera. The camera, sure. <laughs> oh, it's a muffle. Oh, it's a muffle. The mask doesn't help. I know it doesn't. I well, it is. So this is part of our uh, backyard nature summer series in Monarchs and Milkweed. It's the first of three. Our next one is going to be July 25th, searching for pollinators and butterflies. And then our final one is August 29th, which is native pollinator. So we'll be learning about butterflies, bees, and what's important to them. We're going to be touching briefly on native plants and gardening today, but if you really are interested in the gardening nitty gritty, um, join us for that July 25th presentation. All right. But today we're going to be talking about um, monarchs and milkweed. We will be talking about ways that you can help monarchs. Um, throughout the presentation. One of those is through a citizen science project called Monarch Larva Monitoring Program. And like I said, we'll be talking about that mainly towards the end, but we'll touch on it in the beginning. And this is one of a number of citizen science pro projects that we promote and encourage people to be a part of, including one of our very own down here in the lower right hand corner. We do have our very own Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania Chippy Swift Monitoring Program, which is uh, really exciting. But Monarchs and Milkweed, I should also mention that this, this program has been, in the series, has been funded through a grant from the Pittsburgh Foundation, so we're very thankful for that. So, Monarchs and Milkweed. Today we're going to be learning about their migration. We'll go over their life cycle. I am going to teach you how to identify all of the little life stages of the monarch butterfly. So you should be able to, to pull up a leaf and tell what, how old that caterpillar is <laughs> by the time you leave here. We're also going to be talking very importantly about the monarch butterfly's habitat needs, not just the milkweed, but all of its habitat needs. And we're going to be talking again, like I said, about the citizen science opportunity um, at the end. This, I should say, is my favorite picture I've ever taken of a monarch butterfly caterpillar. The only problem is we are looking at its butt. <laughs> if it had only been turned around, this would be like the ultimate photo. But I shouldn't have even told you that because right now many of you might not even know that we are looking at a turn. But I will show you how to how to tell that that you know through the presentation. So why are we talking about monarchs? Well, monarchs are probably the most well-known butterfly here in North America. Just about every school child knows what a monarch butterfly looks like. Most school children and adults even know that monarch butterflies migrate. This is one of the great natural spectacles in our North American world. And when you talk about insects, the distances that these butterflies travel, the migration that they undertake is amazing. Some of these butterflies are traveling 3,000 miles during their migration. How many of you have ever held any kind of butterfly on your hand? Or, and you can't tell online, but I'm sure many of you have. Everybody here is raising their hand. Or a butterfly has landed on you, no matter what kind. They are these delicate, tiny little creatures. You're afraid to touch their wings because you're afraid their scales are going to rub off and you're going to hurt them. And yet, these butterflies, you'll see them flying along the, the ridges um, here in eastern North America. I see them along Allegheny Mountain, the top of the mountain in October. I've got a coat on, and I'll see this little monarch butterfly flying along, you know, and, and, I, and I know that it's like barely even into its journey. So this is one of the amazing natural spectacles. Side note, there is a dragonfly species that does fly farther and it goes over the um, ocean from India to Africa, but you know, here, this is, this is the big deal. <laughs> Wildebeests have nothing on monarch butterflies. 
The other thing about monarch butterflies is they serve as an indicator. If they are doing well, that tells us the habitat they depend on is doing well. And they are an ambassador. So they are the poster child for pollinators, for insects, for wildlife in general. They make us care about it and they give us something to focus on. So that's at least why we're talking about them today. <laughs> All right, so let's move on into this. So this is a wonderful graphic, and um, I should say that um, many of the things you're going to see, we have pulled from a website called Monarch Direct Venture. I will be talking about that website, um, but it is a wonderful resource, everything Monarch Butterflies, and it's a fairly new resource. Um, so the modern butterfly, we're going to first talk about their spring, or um, excuse me, their fall migration and spring overall. So every year we see this little blue dot down here, this is Mexico, and this is a very small area in Mexico. We'll talk about how small the world is. But every year around February, all of these modern butterflies that have spent the winter in Mexico as adults begin to fly up through primarily Eastern North America and the Midwest. And there is a, a little population that goes up here into Arizona and New Mexico area. Um, but primarily, they are east of the Rocky Mountains. This is the Eastern monarch migratory population. Right now, research has shown this population is in danger of quasi-extinction. And I just want to, usually you save this for the end, <laughs> but I just want to bring it up in the very beginning so that you know why we're talking about all the rest and why it's important. So what is quasi-extinction? Quasi-extinction means that within about 20 years, we're expecting these butterfly populations could get so low that they cannot recover. And will we lose the modern butterfly completely? No but we could lose this migratory population um, because its numbers would be so critical. Right now, there's a massive, massive conservation effort. It includes, I think, over 90 organizations under this modern joint venture um, umbrella organization. And their goal is to increase habitat in North America primarily. They're looking for 150 billion new stems of milkweed over the next 20 years. And you know who's going to need to plant that? All of us. That's right. It's not, we tend to think in big things, you know, about farms and big rates of way, but every single one of us with a backyard and some green space and some sun can help in this effort. It's going to require all of us to help. So I just want to put that out there right in the beginning. We'll talk a little bit more about this, this whole cycle as we go through the program. But I just wanted to point that out there right away. All right. There we go. This is a great website. I am going to send you all a link to this website. This is from Journey North. How many in this room, and um, Jim can monitor around the chats, how many of you have seen a monarch butterfly adult or caterpillar this year? Okay, a few of us. How many only saw it within like the past two weeks or three weeks? Yeah, quite a few. When did you see yours? So there is, so um, the person here said that they saw theirs in May. There does seem to be, here where we are, this is, this is a website, it's called Journey North, and it tracks monarch butterfly adult sightings. And you can see the darker red, the color, the later in the spring and summer that it is. So I uh, pulled this in May. So this was May of this year. And um, you can see that May of this year, people in Iowa were already seeing on our butterflies. And we had a few sightings around us, but our, really honestly, I saw my first one of adult a week ago here. We seem to be in this little valley right here where we tend not to see them um, in this first wave of migration. They will get them up here in Wisconsin and Minnesota before we get them because they're getting, they're, they're more of a straight shot from Mexico. We tend to be in this little pocket right here where we don't, we don't see them right away. How many of you think that you are seeing fewer butterflies and caterpillars this year? You are not alone. Everywhere people are reporting. In fact, there are so many reports that the researchers at um, the Monarch Larval Monitoring just 
up, issued an update to deal with that. Everybody is seeing low numbers, but the research says don't panic yet, okay? When we get these butterflies, this butterfly, this is like, this, these are the second generation of monarchs, okay? If we go back, when these butterflies come up in the spring, they stop here in Louisiana and Texas, they lay eggs and they die, okay? I'll go over this again. But then that generation goes through its caterpillar stage, turns into a chrysalis, turns into an adult, and then they fly further up, okay? Some of them may make it up here. We usually don't get like that second generation. We may be getting like the second or third generation. So these butterflies are mating and laying eggs, and then those adults flying up, okay? So we're not, we're, we're getting like the third wave of butterflies up here. Um, they are coming here for this sole purpose. This is our only not G-rated picture here. This is a monarch butterfly mating. I will teach you in a little bit how to tell the male from the female, but they do um, remain attached for hours. And they will actually fly through the air sometimes attached. You can tell the male from the female when they're flying because the male will be the one doing the flying. And the female will just be hanging on. <laughs> and then they find a spot to land and get comfortable. And then, like I said, it takes hours. It's a long process. Each female, um, we'll get to that in a second. This, these generations of butterflies, after that first generation coming up from Mexico, these adults are going to live maybe two weeks, maybe a month, somewhere along that. Okay? Their sole purpose is to make legs. They do eat, so they do require nectar. We'll talk about that. But their main job is to mate. Um, each female butterfly will lay about 500 eggs, and she lays them one at a time. I know, right? For those of you online, you can't see the people going, oh, uh, you're in the audience. <laughs> but yeah, that's a big job. So sometimes she needs two weeks to do it. So let's start some monarch ID, because if you are going to take part in the monarch larva monitoring project, you do need to be able to identify these. Generally, she is laying on the underside of a milkweed leaf. Not always, though. She, they tend to prefer the younger leaves, but not always. And I've seen eggs and photos of eggs on flower pots or flowers. So, but usually it's on the underside of an egg or a leaf, excuse me. Now, this, it can be hard to tell from other little light colored blobs on the underside of a milkweed leaf. The milkweed itself produces a milky white latex, and if it gets a little injury, that will seep out. Sometimes that can look like a, an egg. Um, there are other insects that lay eggs on milkweed. Sometimes there's an aphid skeleton, exoskeleton that looks like a monarch. The way you can tell is I always think of these as a football. They look like somebody took a football and spiked it down into the leaf, and you can see the top of the football. So see how it has like a little point? They always have that little point. And if you're going to get serious about this, I would get a little magnifying glass or your best drugstore reading glasses because these things are small. They are about the size of a sesame seed. They're tiny. They also have these little ridges right along the surface. So those are actually structural ridges. And they're kind of shiny. They will catch the light if you have a little magnifying glass on them. So this little egg is going to be on that leaf for about three to five days. What determines that? Temperature. The warmer the temperature, the faster that egg is going to develop. And that holds true for the entire life cycle, okay, um, or uh, up through the chrysalis. If it's warmer, it's going to happen faster. Now you can tell this little egg is going to hatch. I don't have a picture of it, but you'll see just the ends of that egg will turn black. And the reason it will turn black is because you are seeing the face of the caterpillar getting ready to pop open that eggshell. Okay? So I know, it's so cool. And you imagine this little sesame seed. You can imagine the size of that little caterpillar that hatches out. All right? Um, it's gonna, this is the, this is, so these are the five stages of the caterpillar. That caterpillar right up here, there's this little white blob, I don't know if you can even see it, that is the size of the egg. And these are actual pictures. Um, so that is the egg right there. That caterpillar is then, in, its only job is to eat. That is its sole purpose, is to eat and grow larger. It's gonna go through five growth stages. 
Okay, these are called instars. And this whole process from this little first instar to the big fifth instar is going to take anywhere between nine and 13 days. This little guy right here is going to increase its size by 2,000 times. That would be like you and I weighing 14,000 pounds as an adult. <laughs> that even with the COVID-19 diet, <laughs> none of us are going to get there, right? This is an amazing amount of growth. And that's why they have to eat so much. So let's take a look at each of these instars. So when the little caterpillar hatches out, this is called the first instar, okay? And you'll notice what does it not have? Stripes, right? So the hallmark of the monarch caterpillar are these black, yellow, and white stripes and these tentacles. But the little first instar, when it first hatches out, it does not have those stripes. It has teeny weeny little tentacles that you we don't even count because you can't see them. Um, and it has these little bristly setae on it. Now, where does the black and yellow and white coloring come from? It's first meal. It's actually the milkweed that gives it that coloration. So until it eats, it is not gonna have that coloration. All right, how do you tell it's a first instar? Well, first of all, these are really hard to see. When you look for these, you're pulling up the leaves. You have to be very careful so that you don't knock that little caterpillar off of the leaf. They have a little silk line, but still, they're very easy to dislodge when you're first looking at them. So these little guys, um, they always have a black head. They are the only caterpillar stage of the monarch that has a black head, totally black head. And that is the best way to tell. There you can barely see the front tentacles under extreme magic, mag, magic <laughs> magnification, and you can see the little tiny back tentacles right there. Now, as that caterpillar grows, each of these instar stages has some wiggle room, has some growth room. But eventually they reach a stage where they can't grow anymore in their cuticle. Okay, they're outside the covering that I was talking about. So they can change quite a bit in that instar. So this is also a first instar. Okay, you can see it still has that black head and has these little teeny, weeny, tiny, little, barely noticeable, in fact, you can't even count them, um, little tentacles there. You can't see the back ones at all. The other thing you want to look for is their feeding pattern on the leaf. So this is that milkweed latex, which is where it gets its name. That is sticky. If you've ever touched milkweed and gotten that on your fingers, your fingers get really sticky. It's also not great for the caterpillar. Little tiny caterpillars have died because they got all dumped, dumped in the latex. It can gum up their mouth parts, even the adults. So they actually have this feeding strategy where they'll chew like a little circle and then you know, as, as the latex comes, they'll move to another little circle. And they kind of do this in a semicircle. So you end up with this little C shape, or they also call it window paning. So you'll have these little window panes, and they're generally in this kind of oval pattern at first, or C shaped pattern. This is called trenching. And all of the caterpillars do it, but the pattern will change. All right, so now this is a second in star caterpillar. So do you notice the difference? See those front tentacles? The front tentacles are always the longer ones. These are the front tentacles, and see how they're actually standing up? You can really see them. And now you can just see the nubs of those back tentacles. These are both second <coughs> instars. This is one that just molted, brand new second instar. And this is one that's probably getting ready to change into a third instar, okay? And notice the head, it's not black anymore. It's starting to get these yellow and black stripes on it. So that's another way you can tell that is a second instar. Here is a third instar, and it is showing you how it molts. So this is the head, there are the tentacles, the front tentacles, and there are the back tentacles. What happens is the cuticle covering their face pops off first, right? Sounds horrible, but it's just their skin. <laughs> so that pops off. And then they have a wax that they secrete under their, their old cuticle, and they kind of wriggle out of that like a sleeping bag. Okay, now this is a this process that takes a few hours, um, but that is its shed cuticle behind it. So this is a brand new third instar. You can tell it's a third because if you took these two front tentacles 
and you could, and you're not going to do this, right? <laughs> but if you did, you take those two fine tentacles, and if you push them towards each other, they would just touch like this. The other thing you'll notice is if, if you could pull them forward, which you won't, they would just come to the front of the head. Okay. Um, the back tentacles now, or you definitely can see them, they're standing up nice and proud. And there's the black and white face, right? Or black and yellow face. All right, third end stars start to feed in a different pattern. They move towards the edge of the milk. And you can see this one is actually beginning to notch around a vein. So there's a leaf vein right there, and it's kind of notching that so that it doesn't get a face full of milk. This is a fourth end star, and I have my hand in this picture, and it's a great way to show you size. You can't always go by size, the size of the caterpillar. Um, there can be a lot of variation in the size of the caterpillar, just based on the individual and how far along it is towards that molt. This is a fourth instar, okay? So it's pretty small still. But look at those front tentacles. If we did our imaginary, you know, moving them towards each other, they would actually cross, okay? So they would go past each other. They would go, they go well past the head on the caterpillar. Fourth and fifth instars, the next stage, are hard to tell apart. They can be hard to tell apart, especially when this little fourth guy starts getting really big. There's going to be a test on this too, so I hope you're all okay. <laughs> All right, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm really not. Okay, so <laughs> this, this is one of my pictures. I am not actually sure which stage this is. Can anybody tell what's going on in this picture? here in our live audience. What's this machine? It just molted. And you'll notice, see where the tentacles are? There's still this, I got this one right after it had molted. And its tentacles are still like smeared, like flat against the body. They're not even standing up yet. So I think this was a fourth in star, but it could also be fifth. It could be fifth. It's got, the fifth tends to have these blacker bands right here. In this stage, you really should not handle them at all. They're very, very delicate. That cuticle has to harden up, so you have to be really, really careful with them at this stage. All right, this is like the end product of caterpillar dung. This is the fifth in star. This is a big, beautiful caterpillar. It's hard to tell um, if you're not familiar with the size of milky leaves with that. That caterpillar was probably at least as long as my little finger and probably approaching my big, my, my ring finger here. This is a big, long caterpillar. Its front tentacles are like over a centimeter long. You can see they go way past where the head is. The back tentacles, you can fold them down, they would reach the, the leaf there. And notice the notch in the leaf. This is something that fifth instar caterpillars do. They actually will notch the mid vein of the leaf to cut off that latex flow. And that way they can just feed on the leaf and not worry about getting a face full of latex every time they take a bite. This is also the one stage that is going to travel off of that milky plant usually. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So here's another picture. I think I took this picture. And this shows you two things to look for. First of all, you see that notched leaf, right? And the caterpillar's feeding down here while it's not getting any of that latex. And then what's that? It's caterpillar poop. It, yes, and we call it frass. And this is a really great thing to look for too. When it's a little teeny tiny pepper, or a caterpillar, teeny tiny, it's like little bits of pepper on the leaf. But when it gets to be this great big honking gigantic caterpillar, it is a lot of very big poop pellets. We have several stuck together here. So that you can actually find caterpillars by looking for that. All right, now I told you there was going to be a test. Um, you can play at home too. You can type this into the chat. Guess the end star. So first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. I am going to give you a little bit of time, not much. Look at the tentacles. Look at those front tentacles and how far along they are. And then those rear tentacles. 
All right, does anybody have a guess? Fifth. fifth. I think this is a, now remember I said fourth and fifth are hard to tell apart. I took this picture, I think this is, this is either a big fourth or it's a new fifth. Um, and the only thing that makes me think maybe not quite fifth is just this back tentacle here. It's not quite as long as you would think, but it's definitely either a high fourth or, or early fifth. Also the black, and it could just be the way the caterpillar is sitting, it's not as thick. Sometimes you just can't tell. And that's a good thing, don't stress. If you're having trouble telling, don't stress over it. It's only like, you're not, this isn't a pass fail. Don't worry about failing the course if you can't identify the answer. <laughs> and even if you're doing the modern Florida monitoring project, you still, some of them you're just not gonna be sure. Okay, this one, you should be able to guess though. Look at those, you can barely see the front tentacles and look at the face. What color is the face? Black, so which one is this? This is the first in star. Um, you can barely see those front tentacles and you really can't see the back tentacles at all. And it's got that black face, that's the first in star. And that feeding pattern is pretty typical. All right, yes, the in star, this is the front. And this is the back. That's a tough one, right? So if you moved these two tentacles together, would they touch or would they go past? They, they would, they, they, yeah, they would probably, they would actually go a little bit further. And this is a fourth right here. All right. So this whole process takes about 10 to 14 days. Um, again, it depends on temperature to quite, a, to quite an extent. Um, at the, the final fifth instar, that fifth instar caterpillar is gonna travel, usually travel off the milkweed, and it's gonna find what it considers a safe space. It may not be always what we consider a safe space. And they can usually travel, the literature says nine feet. I've had lots of people report to me that they have seen their caterpillar traveling further than nine feet. Somebody told me 15. Um, so that's something that you could actually research with your caterpillars, follow them. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to find them. But what they'll do is the caterpillar, they can spin silk from their mouth. So they make this little silk button here. And then they turn their body around and stick their little end um, crow leg uh, parts right there into that little silk button. And then they hang in this characteristic shape. This is called the J shape, going into J. And this will, they will be like this for like a day. You'll be waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing. What they are doing is beginning to change inside. Now actually, this caterpillar, while they look very similar, these instars have been changing inside. They are already starting to develop the adult parts inside their body. Their organs are starting to change. They're already starting to get the little, you know, what will be the legs and flight muscles and things like that. Um, in this J, they sit in this J and they continue to change, but then all of a sudden they will split open their exoskeleton. So we have sort of like a little time lapse here. They'll split open that cuticle along the back and they'll begin to wriggle. And what is happening here, this is now the body of the caterpillar. We're considering it a chrysalis now. This is that cuticle that it's kind of wriggling out of. And you can see, it, and this actually moves. It moves at this stage. It wriggles around, it moves, and that little um, cuticle ends up, usually, sometimes it gets wrapped around the top here, usually it falls off. And then it eventually hardens into the chrysalis. This is not a cocoon. Butterflies, butterflies don't make cocoons. This is actually the body of the monarch at this stage, okay? Um, here, down here is where the head is gonna be. Uh, you can, as it develops, you'll be able to see the wings inside of there. Um, but this is generally gonna stay in this state for about another eight to 12 days, again, depending on temperature. And you'll be able to tell it's about to eclose, we call it, because it will become see-through, and you'll be able to see the body, the body of the butterfly inside 
of that crystal. Um, it actually has a seam that it pops open. The adult butterfly crawls out, and it's very important not to handle it at this stage. They're very delicate. They need to hang. They hang upside down, and they pump fluids and let their wings dry out, their body, their abdomen elongates, and then eventually you end up with the adult butterfly. So it's about a month-long process for this whole thing to take place. And like we said, these adults, they're going to live between two and six weeks, except for the very last group of adults, the very last generation. So can anybody tell the male from the female? Yes, and we have some rigors back here, we can tell. Okay, so uh, who thinks they want to point out which one is the male? Yes. Upper left. So upper left, this is the male, and you can tell, there are a couple of ways you can tell. Um, the easiest thing to look for are these two little modified scales right here. They're like little black dots. They're actually a modified scale. There's a gland underneath of there um, that can produce pheromones. Um, and other male butterflies have them as well. This is the female. She tends to have a little bit thicker venation as well. So there you go, male and female. There are some other butterflies that look like monarchs. There are a lot of orange and dark brown butterflies out there. So it pays to, to, to pay attention, but there are some that actually mimic um, monarch butterflies. The viceroy is one of the most exact mimics. This is a not closely related butterfly, but um, scientists used to think it was just um, mimicking the monarch because the monarch actually tastes bad. The monarch, because that caterpillar is eating milkweed, the milkweed plant itself has toxins inside of it. And those toxins concentrate in the caterpillar's body and then they pass through to the adult stage. So even though the adult never eats a milkweed leaf in its entire life, it still has that toxin inside of it. So a bird comes to eat this butterfly, they have actually filmed blue jays going to eat a, a monarch butterfly and actually vomiting afterwards. <laughs> blue jays are fairly long lived. They will learn. I don't want to eat that. Okay, so it works pretty well. Scientists used to think that vice butterflies were just copying monarchs, mimicking them so that butterflies or birds would think that they tasted bad too. But they found out they actually do taste bad. So, but both of them are benefiting from having that warming coloration. Vice butterflies do not, their caterpillars don't look anything like monarch caterpillars. They actually mimic bird poop um, as a caterpillar, which is not uncommon for many butterflies. And I certainly wouldn't want to eat that, so I think that's a good uh, defense as well. There's another butterfly, if we have anybody joining us from the southern reaches. This is a, a queen butterfly. It is actually related to monarch butterflies. Also feeds on milkweed. Also is distasteful. These viceroy butterflies, if they are closer to the range of the queen butterfly, they actually look more like the queen. Just a little interesting aside. We don't have these here um, in Pittsburgh. All right, so let's talk about what that adult needs. So this adult is actually nectaring on a blue lobelia plant. This is a native plant. And these plants bloom in like September, October. I have pictures of bees on this plant back in um, October of last year. So, oops, I don't know how we got that. Um, so you need nectaring plants for your monarch butterflies from May through October, they need nectar. Because remember, they are not feeding on those milkweed plants. That's what they, they only eat nectar. So you have to have, you need habitat that has those flowering plants um, throughout the season. What kinds of flowering plants? I will send you all a, a, you know, an ideal list of um, plants, but it's basically plants that are good for any uh, nectar and butterflies, okay? There's not a special nectaring plant for monarchs. They are butterflies just like all the rest of them. Um, if you go to our website, aswp.org, we have a whole host of plants listed on there that you can uh, learn about which ones are good for nectaring. We have a, two handouts on butterflies and which flowers are good for butterflies. It's always a good idea to have them near milkweed too, so the butterflies don't have to travel too far to lay their eggs, the females. Um, oh, and I should mention, and I will mention this again, we encourage you to plant native plants um, when you're talking about nectaring plants or, or any habitat plants. 
These native plants, including milkweed, they evolved in this area. And they have, you know, they've evolved, have good nectar sources for these butterflies. They do well in our, in our climate, even with the dry weather we've had here lately. So we really, really encourage you to use natives. And if, all, if at all possible, use the wild type, not a cultivar, because those have, they, they have the, you know, all of the wild adaptations for our area for these, these animals. All right, let's talk milkweed real quick briefly here. There are like over 100 species of milkweed that you can find um, in North America. I'm just going to talk about the three common ones here in Western Pennsylvania. You always want to stay with the milkweed that is native to your region. And I will send you on your resource list. There is a um, society called the Xerxes Society. They have a regional milkweed guide that anywhere in North America, you can figure out which, which milkweeds are native to your area. But stick with your milkweeds. They have, their timing is perfect for the monarchs to be here in their migration. This is our most common one. <laughs> this is common milkweed. And this is called a Sluffia syriaca. And this is the one everybody thinks of when they think of milkweed. They have these big, almost tropical looking leaves beautiful like a sort of lavender pink flower and they get the big giant seed pods on them okay and um the seed pods are generally towards the end of summer and they ripen into the fall so this is one of our most common grows in a variety of different conditions likes the sun can grow in partially shady conditions as well pretty tolerant of moisture this is a really beautiful one swamp milky this is one of my favorites it is, has a much narrower leaf, this beautiful kind of magenta color um, flower head on it. And it gets these little, nice, very delicate seed pods. They still have those fluffy seeds inside, but they stand up on the plants that have hanged down. And uh, again, many different types of butterflies can nectar on it. This is a tiger swallow tail right here. And then a shorter milkweed, I should mention the swamp milkweed, it does like damp soil conditions, but a regular garden is fine for them. Butterfly weed, this tends to be a little bit shorter. Um, and if somebody doesn't like the look of the bigger milkweed, this is a really good one to go with. Has these beautiful orange flowers, very narrow leaves, very narrow um, pot. All of these will get milkweed. There's some discussion on which ones they favor, the monarchs favor. I haven't noticed it here. We have mainly common milkweed, uh, but we do also have the other varieties. We've had caterpillars on all of our milkweed. Um, they are starting to do studies to see if monarchs do prefer one over the other. Um, and that, that is an area of research. You want to be careful. There is a milkweed lookalike. It's called dogbane, and it does have these little skinny pods, similar looking leaves, and they do get a little bit of latex. They're actually related to milkweeds. But monarch butterflies will not feed on them. Monarch butterfly caterpillars will starve to death if they do not have them. So it's really important that you get the right plant. The, right plant. the flowers don't look anything like the milkweed flowers. So this is a close-up of an individual milkweed flower. And I just want to spend a few moments on this because milkweeds are bizarre. They're a really odd plant and really cool. So instead of having little tiny grains of pollen, they actually have little packets of waxy pollen, and they're contained in this little horseshoe-shaped structure, okay? And you see this little, this little structure up here, it has a little slit in it. That is what you're looking at right there. Get rid of that, that. But that, where that yellow arrow is pointing is the top of that structure, okay? These are called pollinia right here. So, Nectar is found down in these cups in, in, of the milkweed flower. When an insect steps on this little slit right there, it's like a bear trap. So it actually boom, shuts on the insect's leg. And some insects, if they're small enough, like if you get a tiny bee, they can get trapped there and die. So I know, right? Oh, I, you just, I, you couldn't hear it online. They're just like, oh, okay. So, but you can actually see butterflies and bees. I took this picture. This is a, called a literally a confusing bumblebee. And look at all of those. Those are all those little, um, they're called corpuscular, but they're like those little wishbone shaped um, pollen structures. And they're all stuck to her legs. 
And eventually, they have a mechanism where they begin to dry out. And as they dry out, they open back up. So by the time she's moved on to another plant and steps in another slit, they get deposited in the, in the next flower. So it's like totally like, it's like milkweed the evil genius, you know? It's crazy. Um, so you can see she's going to another milkweed plant. All right, and this is just a, this is from the um, USGS uh, bee inventory lab. They have these phenomenal um, macro photos that they do, and this is a bee's leg with those um, little pollinia, the corpusculum, stuck to the bee's leg. It's really cool. All right, so before we move on, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some critters that we find on milkweed. Does anybody have a question that we can answer? Yes. Why is it so hard to find native plants? Why is it so hard to find native plants? You are getting ahead of me. <laughs> um, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, it can be challenging to find native plants for these. And, and, and so, and I see people nodding their head. We are trying to be a resource for that here in Western Pennsylvania. And if you haven't been to our native plant center upstairs, I will talk about it again towards the end. But we have a native plant um, sales area right above where I'm speaking here in Beachwood, and a native plant nursery where we grow um, native plants. Those of you who are in the Certified Backyard Habitat program, you know we give you a list of other vendors that sometimes have native plants. It can be a challenge. And sometimes, you know, you have to go to a source that is not as close as you would like. And sometimes you do end up having to use a cultivar. Um, but yeah, we hope that now, as it's becoming known that native plants are so important to a landscape and to the, the wildlife that they interact with, that more and more growers are going to be paying attention to that. And we, you even have help with the inventory. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a good thing too because it also means that so many people are buying native plants and we're having trouble keeping inventory, which is not a bad thing, but it can be a bad thing if you're looking for plants. So yes, um, like I said, if you're in the back for Habitat Academy, we try to research a number of, of options for you, but we really are doing our best to keep our inventory up. Um, there is also a website, um, for Pennsylvania at least, um, a native plant atlas, or um, I can't remember the exact title of it, but I will put it on your resource list, that if you are outside of this area, but in Pennsylvania, they also, and Maryland and West Virginia, they also research some places that sell. And you know, call nurseries too and ask them and say that it's important to you. So, Jim? No, I was just gonna add that. Probably one of the best things you can do is be vocal about it, whether it's at a local nursery or even some of the big box stores. Tell them you want true native plants. They're only gonna get it if they think there's volume. And up till recently, it just hasn't been you know, financially viable for them. Uh, to do it, everyone wants that one pretty plant that they can put there as a mistake, you know, whatever the uh, uh, plant of the year is, and that they're getting brought in from Florida or Ohio or somewhere. So they need to know there's a demand, and only by asking over and over and over will they start to carry it. Some of the native plants aren't great. And I would just like to, I would just like to add, Jim, Jim can they hear you on the, on the line back there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so that's the thing, there is, well, one of the things that was just brought up is that sometimes native plants aren't considered pretty, but we are here to tell you that yes, they are. <laughs> there are some absolutely beautiful native plants. If you take a walk up to where we have um, our growing area, you know, or our sales area, there really are some beautiful plants. And on our website, we have a list of native plants that are good for formal gardens, which means they're showing. Um, so we do have those resources available. Any other questions, Jim? I do have an online question. Yeah. That, uh, should we be spreading the milkweed seed to the fly in the fall? Will that help spread the spread of milkweed? So you can spread. So if you have milkweed seeds that are growing right there, you can leave them alone and just let them do their thing. Um, so milkweed seeds do need to they need to go through a cold period. Um, so you don't want to take them and bring them inside. Um, you want to make sure that they are ripe, so you wait until that, that pod has opened in the fall. You don't want to open it when, when it's green. You want to make sure that they are ripe. Um, you can spread them out if you want. Don't dig a hole or don't push them into the ground. They just get scattered on top of the, the, you know, the soil there. 
Um, that's what they're meant to do. That's what they do in nature. They don't have a high germination rate compared to the number of seeds that are produced. So don't expect to spread a whole bunch of milkweed seeds and have that many milkweed plants pop up. Um, we sell uh, small, you know, seedling milkweeds, and that is a really good stage to plant them in. They do really, really well at that stage. If you dig up an adult, like whole milkweed plant, especially if it's common milkweed or butterfly weed, they do have a tap root. And if you don't get all that tap root, they may not make it. So you have to be careful. If you are, if you, you know, if you're transplanting something, you do have to catch it when it's first coming up. You don't want to get it when it's, you know, fairly well established. All right, any other questions? All right, so I just want to spend it. One of the things you're going to be doing as part of this modern global monitoring project, if you're all going to do it, which I hope you are, because it's so much fun and very important, you're going to be looking at a lot of milkweed plants. And this time of year, you know what you're going to be, well, I shouldn't say this time of year, but you know what you're going to see last month when you started doing it? Big zero, no monarchs, no eggs, no caterpillars. And you're going to be like, why am I doing this? You're doing this because, first of all, zero is a very important number. <laughs> Totally important number because researchers need to know you're looking for monarchs and you're not finding any. That tells them a lot. But it's also going to be good for you. You're going to see so many cool things on that milkweed plant. Milkweeds are also like a complete little ecosystem habitat. They're really, really magnificent. You'll, you'll see all kinds of like herbivores, predators. There's like the big cycle of life drama going on on one milkweed plant. This is a really common find on milkweeds. This is another caterpillar that eats milkweed. It's called a milkweed tussock moth. And it also has that orange and black and white, right? And that's morning coloration. These are a native moth. They will decimate your milkweed plant because that mom, that uh, tussock moth, the adult, she comes and she lays a little batch of eggs on your milkweed plant. Not like one, one little egg. One little like she lays a whole little pot of them. They all hatch out, they look like this, and look at what they do to that milkweed leaf. And that milkweed leaf is done, they move on to the next one. And you'll come out and your plant will look like a bunch of little leaf veins, and that's it. <laughs> so they can be really destructive, but they are a natural part of our ecosystem. Um, some other things that you'll see on your milkweeds. Another leaf feeder or seed feeder, these also feed on the seeds. This is a small milkweed bug, and you'll see these. Um, throughout the season, these two are mating. I lied, there's a second um, not G-rated picture there. Uh, you'll also see their young. These are their nymphs. So when they hatch out of the egg, this is what they look like. A lot of people confuse these with aphids when they're very small. You'll have a whole bundle of those on your milkweed plants. These are like very, very pretty um, insect, but they do feed on your milkweed. This, everybody thinks this is a late bug. This is a milkweed longhorn beetle. If you look at our milkweed up front, this is what they look like right now. They're covered with these milkweed beetles. And they're mating. They're also, they chew the leaves as well. So they'll chew a big section out of the leaf. Are they good or bad? Ah, well, you know, they're, 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 they're part of the natural ecosystem. They're a native insect. They, your plants are meant to be grazed on. That's the way they evolve. Native plants, we have to get out of this idea that our plants should be pristine, shouldn't have any holes. You know, native insects and birds and mammals, when everything's in balance, they're, they're meant to feed on Do they them. eat the monarch? They will, no, they, they mainly feed on the leaf. And it's important to realize, monarchs can eat each other. Sometimes you get a big monarch and it's munching along and it, there's a little baby, a little tiny caterpillar in its way and it just munches right through it. So, yeah, and there are predators of monarchs, and that's natural too, for the most part. Um, there are also just some like hangouters, I call them. So these little um, beautiful little flies that hang out, they just rest on the milkweed leaves. This is a katydid that's on one of our milkweed leaves. You'll see predators. Um, this is a one of, I believe, our native ladybugs out on one of our milkweed leaves. These probably don't match the species, but Ladybugs actually will lay their eggs on milkweeds, and they'll feed on aphids, it's one of their favorite foods. They will also feed on monarchs. Uh, these are baby ladybugs, ladybug larva, and they are voracious predators. This is a little um, jumping spider who's just caught a fly of some kind. You find lots of these on your milkweed leaves. I highly recommend this book, it's called Milkweeds, Monarchs, and More, a field guide to your milkweed patch. 
And it was actually um, created by the researchers that are part of the modern water monitoring project and uh, Bar Ray, who was a Western Pennsylvania native. Um, so it's a very cool book. Uh, we don't currently have copies of this, but you can check with Sam and um, see if you can get a, you know, have them ordered through our bookstore. And, um, you know, I encourage you to use your local bookstore. To that. But this has all of those other critters, including monarchs, that you find on the All right, so now we're going to go. Yes. Our other question is that uh, someone had mentioned that they had the red insect and I'm not sure which one. Okay. Uh, all over the seeds. And it seems like there are hundreds of them. Yeah. Are they okay or should they try to get rid of those? So those, if you had hundreds of them all over the seeds, that was definitely either this milky bug, the small milky bug, bug or there's another one that's a little bit bigger, and it's called, wait for it. The large milk people. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. <laughs> and the way you tell them apart is you see how this one has more of like a triangle X right here? The large milky bug has a big black band going right across. But they have very similar nymphs. And if they were all over the seeds and there was a whole bunch of them, it was probably these, they're nymphs, they're young. And they are eating the seeds. So you can take them off, but you can also let nature take its course because these are native insects. So they are a natural part of the milkweed ecosystem. If they are feeding on the seeds, the seeds will be viable. So, but these guys are also food for other animals. So they don't just exist in a vacuum. They are providing a food source for spiders and birds and things like that. Yeah, we break it down. You yeah. mentioned that um, milkweed seeds have a fairly low germination rate. I think right now for some of the plants that are, they're believing it's about 10%. 10%. Of all the ones that they sow that actually grow. Yeah. So in some ways that's 90% that aren't going to be, in which case there's probably a lot left yeah. for those other guys. Their impact if they're eating seeds is probably not. That's true, absolutely. Yeah, they're probably, they, and like we said, that all goes back to don't worry about your plants getting eaten because they're supposed to be eaten. <laughs> so actually, can I be off the topic? Yeah. Often, I have quite a list of seeds in milkweed. Um, none of them eat them. There is nothing. And I'm a backyard habitat, so I have all that. Is it fairly new? No. You've had it for a while? It's about three years. It's about three years, and you don't have any insect this like eater? There's nothing. This, this. Well, I mean, there might be other insects. Yeah. Them. Check, check for these other insects on it. Like I said, though, have you seen any monarchs in the area? We seem to be, this seems to be a late year this year. And it, it's across the board. So don't give up on it yet. Um, you know, I, we've had plenty of activity on ours, but I know that a little bit earlier in June, there wasn't much activity at all. So it may just be taking a little bit. Time. All right, so let's talk about the return journey home. Um, these are two of our beechwood monarchs ready to head south. So the final generation of monarchs in the fall. So we may have like, you know, this might be the third or fourth generation up here. This August generation is the one that's going to turn around and head back to Mexico. So in the spring, they sort of puddle jumped. You'd have one generation here, another generation would take this journey. This final generation, they're gonna fly the entire 3,000 miles down to, if you're, they're up here, yeah, like 3,000 miles, if they're up in this area, down to Mexico, right? So this generation and only this generation goes through what we call reproductive diapause. It pauses. It, sort of goes into suspended animation as far as reproducing. It doesn't have that like lay eggs and die um, factor. And they are gonna fly down, like I said, I, you know, I've seen them oftentimes flying south along the ridges in the middle of Pennsylvania. It's the coolest thing. Um, just sometimes you can't see multiple butterflies too. In September, you just see one right after the other. So just really fascinating. But the thing is, is the entire way they need to have nectar. They don't need milkweed anymore, but they do need nectar. So that's where we all come in, providing that habitat for them. These butterflies are gonna live for like seven to nine months. This is a pretty long-lived adult. They cannot survive cold temperatures, and this milkweed dying back and the day length getting shorter, that is their clue that they have to leave and they have to fly south. 
And they all head to Mexico and they head to this one little area at its peak. It is about 12 acres. That was in the, in the high peak, it was about 12 acres, okay? On these mountains of Mexico at about 10,000 feet, on these fir trees, they're called oyamel firs, and that is where they spend the winter. And they spend the winter, this is millions and millions of butterflies. They, these are all butterflies. And they hang out on the, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. <laughs> they all cling to the branches. They do very little, like you will get clouds of them. Um, so here, these are all butterflies. They do, they do feed a little bit. They will nectar a little bit, but primarily they're just hanging out and drinking water. Why do they pick this spot? The elevation keeps a fairly constant cool temperature. And that cool temperature is not cold enough that they're going to freeze to death. But it's not warm enough that these are, you know, insects are cold blooded. So if it's, the temperature's too high, their metabolism speeds up, they're actually not going to survive the winter. They're not going to have enough food, they're not going to have enough resources. Um, so, and they, they're able to cluster together, and that sort of also offers them protection from the elements and to some extent predators. So this one little area is where all of these butterflies congregate. They do have some mortality there. This one is actually drinking. They drink, they'll, you know, I'll come down and drink some water. But they do have some birds down there that will feed on them and some insects. Um, and sometimes you get storms that come through in the winter there that will, this was a very sad picture. This was from 2002, where they had a big winter storm at the reserve down in Mexico and just lost thousands and thousands and thousands of butterflies. This, so this was 2002. There is also still continued logging going on around the area, which is a problem. But um, I was watching a webinar recently and um, the researcher Karen Oberhauser out of the uh, Arboretum, Arboretum, Arboretum in Wisconsin, somebody asked her if she was afraid to go down to Mexico. She goes down every single year. She said no. And she said, it is such a wonderful place and I, I always feel safe and the research effort and the conservation effort down there at that reserve is just wonderful. Um, but the butterflies that do make it in February, they sort of wake back up and they fly up into Texas and Louisiana. They mate, they lay eggs, and they die. Then that generation flies up into the rest of North America, does the same thing, mate, lay eggs, die, and then that's how we get our generations of butterflies. So the generation that survives winter is the same generation that flies to Mexico? So yes, so the same generation that came south, flew that big long trek, they do not mate at all until, um, or they don't lay eggs until like February. February, then they turn around, they only fly up to about here, lay eggs, die. And then that new generation. So in the spring, it's sort of like a puddle jump of generations. But in the fall, it's like one adult flying all the way down. So it's, it's a pretty remarkable term. How do you think it happened in California? Did the Rocky Mountains? Great question. Yes, the Rocky Mountains are definitely a, a divide there. So that's a great question. The Western population, for the most part, they all fly to California for the winter, and then they go back into the Western states for the spring summer. That population is also declining, and they really don't have a good handle on why at the moment. Um, they're doing a lot of research into that. Um, but these butterflies, it's a tough life. And you can imagine storms, predators, these are all things that affect them. But when you add habitat loss and climate change to the mix, they are facing like an uphill battle. Um, so this is where we really come in, come into the, the next example. <coughs> so milkweed is the most important thing on that spring journey. Milkweed and nectaring plants. We need to have those stems of milkweed all along this journey for them. Uh, this is a graph from the Monarch, uh, Monarch Joint Venture website. And Monarch Water Monitoring Project, they have been tracking, this is a 25 year long citizen science project. They've been tracking the Mexico population, the winter population since um, 1993. And what they do is they don't count individual butterflies, they count the area that's occupied by those monarch butterflies. That's in hectares, which is a little over two acres. Um, so you can see 
yearly, these are, this is each year up to 2019, yearly, you get these spikes up and down, right? We had this really great year in um, 1995, 97 or 95, where you had 18 hectares, right? <coughs> totally amazing. And then you went back down to the six hectares down there. But if you look overall, don't pay attention to these up and down, up and down so much. Don't pay attention to the individual years, pay attention to the decades. And look what's happening to the mean number, that, that kind of average number over the decades. It's declining, right? And it's declining for right? I didn't So um, you can see that the number of hectares covered occupied by monarchs has really gone down over the years. So we're at between like two and three hectares average. We had a couple of really bad years in 2012, 2013, where we that year we didn't see any monarchs here at all, not a single one. Um, and we thought they were done. But you can see they rebounded a bit, but they're nowhere near where they used to be. And the danger is, is that when you combine those storms and droughts and predators and decreasing habitat, that eventually they're not going to be able to recover. So that's where we come in, where we can help. So habitat loss, big areas of habitat loss include farm fields where they used to have strips of milkweed growing in between the crops or along the edge, and now they don't because of, you know, herbicide spraying, they don't want any weeds, they don't have to do any weeding, so they, they've eliminated that milkweed crop. In some places, this is changing. Um, farmers are starting to do strip farming where they alternate their crop rows with native plants, including milkweed. So that is changing to some extent. This is huge. How many neighborhoods look like this, right? Hopefully you're like that one house over here that's like full of flowers and full of you know native trees. But this, if a monarch, imagine this is your view as a monarch as you're flying by. Maybe not this high, but I mean that's like starvation right there. But imagine if each one of these backyards was planted with native wildflowers and milkweed. That would be a refuge for that butterfly. It would be somewhere they could stop and they could get nectar and they could lay eggs. And that would be a huge, huge impact. And if you get enough of those backyards together, then you've replaced a huge amount of habitat, little by little. The kinds, the care that you take, and you folks in the Certified Backyard Habitat Program know this, um, having that habitat is one thing, but also making sure that it's a safe habitat so that it doesn't have pesticides. You're not using pesticides, and you're not using plants that have pesticides already in them. Um, uh, especially one that's especially bad are the neonicotinoid class of pesticides. They're very damaging to our native pollinators, and many companies are phasing that out, but you still do have to check on the variety of plants. Um, so know your nursery, ask them if there have been pesticides used or are in the plant itself when you buy your plants. This is uh, just a picture of a little plug for our uh, native plant nursery. Um, we grow all of our things without pesticides. All of our plants, or the vast majority of our plants, are grown right here on site um, from seed that we have collected locally um, or from our, our stock in our, our growth area. And these plants are the right type for your area. This little mini, almost drought that we've just you know, been going through. They're weathering it pretty good. You know, they're, they're, you don't have to go out there and water them every single day or anything like that. They grow in our conditions, they're used to them. And um, if you buy them from someplace like us, you are supporting local conservation. But even like Jim mentioned, and like we said, go into your regular nursery and saying, I would like native plants for this area and making it known that that's what you want. Um, just some other things that, that if you're going to be doing modern larvae monitoring, there are diseases that monarchs get. I just wanted to touch on this a little bit because we do get questions about this all the time. There are a number of natural diseases and parasites that affect monarch butterflies at all stages of their life. Um, these are 
a chrysalis and larva that have been attacked by tachinid flies. And there are hundreds of species of tachinid flies, but they actually come along and they lay their eggs on a caterpillar. And then the larva burrows its way into the caterpillar. And then it's all, yeah, I know, everyone's going, oh, it's like Revenge of the Body Snatchers or Alien, remember the Alien movie? That's what happens. The little um, fly maggots, the larva burst out of her beautiful fifth instar caterpillar, and the caterpillar is toast. So that does happen, but it is a part of nature. Um, sometimes the entire chrysalis will turn black. There are some wasps that parasitize the caterpillars as well, chalcid wasps. There is a protozoan called OE that affects adults, caterpillars, uh, chrysalis. It doesn't necessarily always kill them, but it does uh, reduce their fitness level. This is something you really have to worry about down south. If you're in North Florida, um, you really have to be careful about the kind of milkweed you, you plant. You want to plant just the native type for your area. You don't want tropical milkweeds that um, stay blooming or active throughout the year. You concentrate this protozoa. You do have to be careful. Um, there are also just natural predators. Insects don't seem to be as bothered by the toxin in the caterpillar. And like we said, some birds have evolved to be able to feed on them. Um, and we did talk about the winter storms, um, droughts, changes in plant distribu distribution. So climate change is going to be a big thing, a big factor for modern butterflies, and just where that milkweed is found and where the nectar plants are. All right, so what you can do, create habitat, plant milkweed, plant nectar plants that bloom from summer through fall, have shrubs and small trees that can provide those butterfly shelter. Those are all very, very important. If you are not a part of our Certified Backyard Habitat Program and you are in the area, we definitely encourage you. We can help you along in this process. It's a really great program. Um, we'll come, actually come out to your site and make recommendations for what you can do to help wildlife. You can go to our website and sign up online for that. And then <coughs> lastly, help scientists learn more about the monarchs. There are a lot of things that they still don't know. And you are able to contribute information and understanding about what the populations of monarchs are doing and when. So where their populations are rising, where they're dropping, and why. So there are several, there are actually 16, or now 17, there was a new one that just popped up last night, or last week, 17 different citizen science projects relating to monarchs currently. Um, some of the easiest, and I will send have this on your resource, resource list, Journey North, which you just report adult butterfly sightings. Monarch Lark Monitoring Project, which I'll just go over real briefly here in a moment which deals with the eggs and caterpillars. And then Water Watch, which is a program where you can actually tag adult butterflies and release them and, um, to be released uh, and hopefully recaptured soon. Um, all of these are under the Monarch Joint Venture website. I will provide you a link for that, uh, as I said. And this is the Monarch Joint Venture list of participating organizations. So you can see all kinds of fish and wildlife, um, national government, um, nonprofit organizations that are part of Monarch Joint Venture. So it's a really wonderful program. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project is under that umbrella. And this is the one, Monarch Larva Monitoring, very easy to participate in. You do it once a week, and you monitor your milky patch for eggs, caterpillars, and adults. They have a very easy, they have redone their entire website. It's very easy to navigate. They have a whole host of resources on there. Um, if you forget everything I just said today, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what she was talking about. Go to this website. They have all of this information on it. You can also ask me. You can email me. Um, but you can, you also have access to the data, which is really cool and very important. Um, this is an example. I just pulled this up. This is a list of monitoring sites in Pennsylvania and um, or data, the results of the data from monitoring sites in Pennsylvania. So this is from 2019. It starts here in April and goes till September 22nd. And each week it shows you the number of eggs. So here on 714, 
You can see the light blue, that's the number of eggs that were found on plants. This is the number of first instars, second instars, third, fourth, and fifth instars. So what do you notice right off the bat there from that down? First of all, yeah, you get a big spike in population in July, right? And that's normal. That's a big spike. If you were down south, you get a spike here and then another spike here. But here we just go, whoop, July, done. <laughs> what else do you notice? Know? Who's surviving? Who do you see? What do you find the most of? Eggs, yeah. They're just like anything else. It is a tough life for a monarch. Most of them don't survive to that last instar stage. Except look here in September. Everybody's finding just fourth and fifth instars, right? I think that's pretty cool. All right. So how do you do this? You just pick a site. It can be your backyard. Um, someplace you have milkweed and permission to count. So if you go off to the side of the road, make sure you're all right there. Um, if you have a small patch of milkweed, you can count all of them. Our site up here, I usually count about 75 plants um, a week, or our volunteers do. If you have a huge patch, you can do a random sample. Random is random. Don't cherry pick your milkweed. Don't go, oh, that one has a big fifth instar using that one. You just have to, they, they have guides on there on how to do that, how to make this. They have a whole bunch of activities you can take part in. But the most important, and I think the, the easiest one to do, is measuring monarch density. So this is the one where you're going to look at your milkweed plants and survey the number of eggs and caterpillars. And this is a, a picture of the data sheet. I'm just going to go through this once really quickly. The best way to figure out how to do this is to actually do it. Okay, so it, it's not as hard as it looks. You mark down the year, who you are, you give your site a name, um, you'll do all this online as well, and which milkweed species you're observing. So for us here, we'll be common milkweed, put the date, what time you start, what time you stop, and over here you can't see, they ask you for the temperature. All of that is available on your smartphone. Then you go through, and you're looking at plants. So you go through your first couple of plants, you go up the plant, down the plant, both sides, you find nothing. And you do that for five plants, right? Nothing. You're getting discouraged, but you didn't see a cool beetle and you saw a cool spider. So you're like, oh, this is great. But you mark down your five plants under zero monarchs per plant. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. Then on that sixth plant, boom, you found an egg. You get really excited, right? This little box, so this is one monarch per plant. This little box right here represents one plant. And I found an egg on it. Then I go through, I find another egg. So that plant gets its own box. Then my next plant, I find a second instar. It gets its own box, okay? Then I find a first instar on the next plant, right? Okay, now, pretty straightforward, right? Then I count a few more plants. I didn't mark them down here, I should have. Then I get to this one plant, and it has three monarchs on it. It has one egg, one first instar and one second instar. So this box is now one whole plant with three monarchs on it. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, if you do it a couple of times, it will make sense. You are always welcome to come up and, and tag along as we do it. Um, and I will say the website does walk you through it pretty well. They do a really nice job of walking you through. When you finish up, after you tally all of your plants, you go down here to the bottom, you let them know how many plants you did in total, how many total eggs, and all of the stages that you found. It also asks you if you found anything from the dead and any adults. Then you go to their website online. Whoops. Oh, they, I should mention, they also ask you if you've seen any plants blooming and if you've seen any of these guys. What's that? Aphid. This is a special kind of aphid. It's called a... Um, um, uh, Aphis nerii, it's um, oleander aphid. It's a non-native aphid species that they are tracking. So they ask you if they want to know if it's having an impact on um, monarch species. So they will ask you if you've seen them. If you don't, if you forget or you're not sure, it's okay. After that, you go online to their um, data portal and you just go to enter data. They walk you through how to enter your results into their website. If you do it wrong, they will 
email you and they'll say, hey, can you double check this? They're very nice, but they actually do pay attention to what you're, what you're putting in. And at the end of the day, you are helping to preserve this by taking part. So anything you do, planting milkweeds, planting nectaring plants for these butterflies, and if you can, doing the citizen science tomorrow, you're doing a huge amount of progress. So you can pat yourself on the back. Mm -hmm. That you don't want to make a thing. Do we have any questions? Yes. What are your thoughts about trying to raise them? Like if you Great question. I was hoping somebody would ask me because if I, I was like, back put that in the presentation, it's going to be even lower. So raising monarchs. So here's the official, um, the, the folks at the Monarch Monarch Monitoring Project. There is a great benefit to raising a few monarchs for you. It's a great chance to see their life cycle. It's wonderful for school kids to be able to see that. Um, it doesn't really have a huge impact on the monarch population. You're not, in other words, you're not helping them a great deal by raising them. So one of the, the ideas behind raising them is if you get them, especially at the egg stage, you can get them before those parasites have a chance to attack them, and um, they have a better chance of making it to adulthood. So the parasites were predators. I never raised them until I actually saw them being the yeah. killers and being attacked. You do, and if you're gonna do that, I would encourage you to go to the Monarch Joint Venture website because they have how to raise them responsibly. You need to really keep them all separate um, because they will spread any disease. You really need to be careful about cleaning um, all the materials that you use. Where they really draw the line is raising hundreds and hundreds of them, and especially commercial operations. Commercial operations, you know, like you can buy butterfly release things. First of all, there's a much bigger chance for disease to be introduced into those populations, and then when they get released, for that disease to go into wild populations. The other, there are two other things. There's a lot of research now that says that butterflies that are not raised with natural light have issues with migration. So they have to be exposed to natural light during that development process. So you've got them in your house and you're raising them, that can be an issue. And then the last part is when you have these companies that are raising them maybe in Iowa and you're buying them here in Pennsylvania and releasing them, that population is not a native population to this area. So that's, so in general, Personal private rearing, just do it safely, you know, and that's okay. But mass, large scale, don't buy butterflies to release at your life. Okay, a question online from someone asking about the Monarch Watch Way Station program and thoughts on that. So the Monarch Watch Way Station, and that is the one where you're actually creating butterfly habitat. And that is an excellent, excellent, and that is actually also under the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, umbrella. So you will find that Monarch Watch way station. So, and th this is Monarch Watch is where you actually grab the adults and tag them. And they do encourage you to do that. And how are you tagging them? They have these little stickers that you put on their wings. And each sticker has its own number. And um, so the the idea is that when those butterflies then continue on their journey south, and you're only doing this in like August and September. And when those little butterflies continue on their way south, eventually when they expire, they will find that butterfly and the tagging information will tell them where it started out or where it was tagged. So that is a very, very good program. And I believe as part of that also, there is the idea of creating habitat um, for those butterflies. So that's, that's, def that's okay. Um, and again, you do have to go through a training process to be able to do that responsibly. You have to order your tags, and so it is a well-monitored program, definitely. Yes? You touched on this when you said, when you had the slide up that says, know your nursery. Yes. But I think it needs some emphasis that a lot of nurseries are not really down to avoiding birds or Pesticides and, and uh, neonates at points. Yes. And in my experience, has been they don't even know what they're doing. And that's so. The, the, let me just repeat that for the online folks. So, um, the gentleman said that 
in his experience, a lot of these nurseries, first of all, they are they they are not uh, they don't have a positive outlook towards not using pesticides, and in many cases, they don't even know where their um, supply comes from or how it is treated. So whether or not it has pesticides in it or it's been grown with pesticides. And that goes, and you know, you can be, some growers are very good. Some, some nurseries are very good and others are not, it's like anything else. And that goes back to what Jim said, that you really have to make it known that that's important. It's just like when you go to a restaurant and you ask where your salmon came from, or, you know, was it farm fished or where did it come from? And the more you do that, the more restaurants are like, oh, that's important, you gotta know that. Um, so I think it's, you just well, have to keep The last time it happened, and we couldn't manage the request, and I said, okay, then I work out of class. And that's exactly what you do. You, you, you vote with your, <laughs> educate with your dollars there, you know? Because that's the thing, if it's, if it's going to mean more business, and this is only some, some growers are really conscientious. Do you, do you have a commercial nursery that you know of around here that are, I said that. I, I right. mean, yeah. That's taken from your answer. We understand that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, I don't, we, I don't think you can have much confidence in anybody. Yeah, you do, you do have to, and you, you're right, you really do have to research. You really do have to research. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more because I didn't know why that? Are some plants treated with pesticides as well? And we yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, you, you sometimes, and, Jackie, can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Chuck. So she was asking, she didn't realize that some plants come to you with pesticides already in them and or on them. And that's the thing is that, that now they can they can engineer these plants so that they're grown. The seed actually can contain the so you you have to know, you have to ask. And that's the difference, and that's where you come down to the difference between having a native plant that is part of the ecosystem versus a plant that its only job is to look good in your front yard. And you have to make the decision, which, which I think I know what the decision is for everybody in this room and online. You know, those plants have a, a bigger purpose than just being there for us to look at them. I mean, they are part of an ecosystem. They are survival for a huge number of insects, birds, mammals. Maybe that mammal doesn't eat that plant, or that bird doesn't eat that plant, but it might eat an insect that's eating that plant. That hawk is eating a mouse that's eating seeds from that plant. So that's what we really have to, we really have, you know, we have to educate the growers and then it comes back to saying, this is what's important to me. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. I know this was a really long program. Um, I promise the next one won't be as long if you, <laughs> if you do the right name for butterflies, but um, for and pollinators. But I really hope that you all, you know, are enthusiastic about doing your part. And um, I want to thank you for spending the morning with us. And we are here as a resource for you. If you have any questions along the way, so thank you very much. Thank you.